Today we will talk about processing of PN junctions. So far we have looked at the individual devices, a PN diode, its applications, its device characteristics and where all it can be applied. Uh, but having a good device is not the only reason for success. Today we have electronics in our life, uh, it, has, uh, uh, it has become part of our lifestyle to use so much electronic products because there has been a, a hand in hand development in the manufacturing of microelectronics. And hence today's lecture I, have, uh, I am devoting to understanding how we fabricate microelectronics. And uh, in this uh, I will start with uh, processing a simple discrete device PN junction and then show you how it is very uh, important for a material science engineering student to know about this field because it opens a new career path. You can think of uh, a career in semiconductor processing industry. Uh, so, let us start uh, with the uh, PN junction processing and uh, the way this processing it leads to how we do the microelectronics fabrication. So, I have been describing a PN junction to you in which the PN junction is consisting of P part and the N part. And then we will make a metal contact to the P and N side. And while describing this junction, we said that the contacts are ohmic and so we did not look at its characteristics. We basically, we focused on the characteristics of a P N junction and looked at the device characteristics. Today, we want to see if I need to fabricate this P N junction, how will I do that? How can I make this PN junction? Of course, a very simple metallurgical solution would be you make the contact, you make the P type, you make the N type semiconductor, you make the P type and you try to join them by using some conventional joining technique. But immediately you know from your knowledge that that is not possible because in a device it is not only these four components which are important, but the interfaces between these components have their own characteristics and that requires a very special processing for microelectronic devices. Okay. So, this is what we are going to learn and uh, the advances in this fabrication processing is what has made electronics so cheap today. So, I hope you will appreciate that part uh, in the coming slides. So, if I want to make a P n junction in the uh, semiconductor processing fabrication, I uh, normally use a technique called planar technology and the name will become clear as we describe this process. We are taking an example of a discrete P n junction to describe the process. Now, in this process, we are going to start with a silicon wafer and I am going to start with the n type silicon wafer. How do we get this wafer? We are going to get this wafer from growing a single crystal silicon bool which is then cut into small wafers which are about 500 micron thick and their size can be anywhere from 2 inches to 12 inches today. Uh, 2 inches was very early period of semiconductor technology when people started making devices and today they are making very large wafers. So, this silicon is n type and I am just giving an example of how to make a single PN junction. On this n type silicon I am going to deposit silicon oxide. How am I going to deposit this silicon oxide? I am going to use a technique which is a thin film deposition technique. Which can be either chemical vapor deposition or thermal deposition, thermal oxidation. And by that I will grow a, a required thickness of silicon oxide on this. From there uh, thin film deposition process, I am taking a detour to a process called photolithography by which I open a window in this silicon oxide. Now, what is this photolithography process? Let us look at various sub processes in this process, which is the first one is we deposit a photoresist in short form called PR. Uh, this we can spin coat, this is a polymer in certain solvents and additives. After pin, spin coating it, we normally pre bake it to get certain amount of uh, uh, hardness there. Then we expose it to UV light, this is a light coming through a mask. So, the portion where there is no mask, the light will come through 
and where there is a mask the light will not come through. Now, the property of this photoresist is chosen such uh, that in this particular case wherever the light has come through its proper, uh, chemical properties have changed. So, that is that part portion is exposed and wherever the light is not there that portion is not exposed. So, what do we have now? After we develop after we uh, done with the exposure when we develop in certain chemicals or developer then the part which is exposed is removed. So, as a result what I have done I have taken a flat film and I have created a pattern in this and that uh, uh, pattern is created only in the PR at this point, but what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a pattern in the silicon oxide. So, I need to follow it up with the etching process. So, after opening the window in the photoresist I will etch and I will use the etchant for silicon oxide by, the, by that process I will etch a window in the silicon oxide and then I will remove the photoresist and what I have done is the initial film which was a blanket silicon oxide film has a opening in this. Uh, particular area. Now, this whole sub process is called photolithography and we can generate any type of pattern uh, by designing a particular mask by using this process. Now, that I have done this what I am going to do is I need to create a n type uh, p type here because I started with the n type substrate I need to create a p type here. Now, for that I need to bring in a p type dopant and I can bring it by two processes one is called diffusion and the other one is called ion implantation. Uh, diffusion can be through a gas phase or using a solid phase and ion implantation is through energetic ions. By these two processes by any one of these two processes we bring in the p type dopant here. Now, that you have the p type dopant here you would finally, go through an annealing process and create a region here which is p type. So, what we have done is we had a n type a semiconductor in which we have created a p type region. Now, I need to make the context the metal context to it. So, what I do is I do again a silicon oxide deposition just similar to uh, the earlier one. Now, uh, keep in mind in this case I can use oxidation in this part, but above the silicon oxide oxidation might be a little bit slow. So, some sort of chemical vapor deposition might be required, but in any case I create another film here and then I go through the same uh, sequence of sub processes to create two windows one here and one here. Okay, so, what I have done I have opened a window which will make a contact to n type and I have opened a window which will make a contact to p type. So, I did the first photolithography step here then I am doing the second photolithography step to open the contacts in between I changed the property of n to p type. And now I need to make contact so I do a another thin film deposition process which is uh, to deposit the metal. Uh, now, once I deposit the metal and if I have not used a mask it is a blanket deposition and then it will basically short the p and the n type and there is the n type here there is the p type here. So, to avoid the shorts between the n and the p type I need to further photolithography masking of the contacts so that only the contacts are in the p and n type. So, I, I do another third masking uh, photolithography step to uh, open this area so that there is no shorting of the p and n contact ok and this of course, p type remains as it is here. So, now if you see this if I can make contacts to the outside world this is a p n junction this is the outside contact to the metal to the p going to the to the n going to the p type and then again a metal contact. So, this is a p n junction it looks very much different from what I had made earlier, but it has the same electrical character characteristics this is uh, p type n type as then what I wanted to draw or what I have discussed earlier. So, it looks different, but it has same IV characteristic that this particular structure will have. Now, this technology is called planar technology because everything that I am doing is within few microns of the top layer it is almost in the same plane I am working to make this device. And uh, what are the processes that I have used I have used thin film deposition I deposited silicon oxide photoresist and metal I have used photolithography wherever I needed to pattern my uh, film and I have used etching because I needed to etch uh, number of times I etched the silicon oxide I etched the metal in order to separate out different blocks and I also used doping to change the semiconductor property from n to p type. 
in addition to this there is the process in uh, um, semiconductor manufacturing which which is basically between each process when I take it from one machine to the other machine my wafers are getting contaminated. And this is another requirement for semiconductor manufacturing because as I said each of this interface has its own characteristics and if it is contaminated you may lose it and that is a requirement of clean room. If I do not have a clean room then I do not make good devices and that requirement then also makes it uh, important to clean the substrates between each process. So, almost between each of these process there is a cleaning process which is to make sure that no contamination goes from one tool to the other tool. So, these are the main processes by which I complete the fabrication of a single simple p n junction diode and uh, uh, this has many advantages. The biggest advantages it has is that I am making contacts to the device both from the top side. Now, it allows me to make many such devices on the same wafer and make contacts to them. So, I can integrate many devices together and that leads to the advantages of this planar technology which has uh, led to the revolution of electronics and the first one of that is it allows for very large scale integration. Which means you can make large number of devices on the same silicon wafer and then contact them. In addition to that by ensuring the cleanliness of the devices generally when we make uh, these circuits the yields are high. And this is because we use clean rooms. And further the development has been uh, enormous. Uh, we know something uh, called Moore's law which basically states that the development in the processing technology of microelectronics has been almost to double the number of devices in uh, per unit area of the microelectronics uh, chips. Which means every year the processing technologies has developed enough to put more devices on a small chip and they have uh, that uh, law has been continued for almost half a century very successfully. Uh, so, following the Moore's law we have more and more devices being more devices are integrated on the same semiconductor chip. Almost up to the point that today when we are uh, reaching almost the physical limit of trying to put more devices on one chip. Uh, people are going towards quantum devices because uh, all the device physics we are learning is going to uh, uh, fail if we go to even very small devices in the nano range and that is leading to a new field called nano electronics. But uh, in the last 50 years the development has almost followed Moore's law and if you want to continue with Moore's law you need to think of new kind of devices the conventional devices will not work. So, these are the reasons why uh, we have had a very successful uh, revolution uh, silicon age in last 50 years and uh, it allows you to have very cheap PCs and all sort of electronic gadgets that we can use today. The, the final point is the fabs which are uh, of course, have a very high clean uh, room they are fabs are automated to ensure that the yields are high and we have um, costs are reduced because of these measures. So, this planar technology has uh, played a very important role uh, in deciding overall how we have uh, been manufacturing electronics and uh, as in last 50 years there have been many innovations in the materials and devices to bring out new and better devices. At the same time the processing technology has kept up in order to make more and more devices at a cheaper cost by putting large number of devices together. So, uh, the, the development in the two phase has been almost hand in hand and that is why uh, this is a very successful industry it will continue to grow in coming years. So, having uh, introduced to you the planar technology let me summarize from uh, materials point of view what are we looking at. Uh, you can think of the fabrication of any microelectronic devices in terms of four steps 
and the first one is thin film deposition. The second one is when we change the characteristics of a semiconductor doping photolithography because we need to pattern and after patterning we need to etch each layer. So, etching and the cleaning process. So, any integrated circuit fabrication is basically repetition of these unit processes again and again. You saw in a very uh, simple p n junction, we had to do the photolithography three times. The if you uh, count each process, it would be more than 40 processes to make a simple p n junction. So, if you are thinking of making a microprocessor, you can almost think the complexity of a microprocessor, there will be number of steps are going to increase and keeping the yields high after all those steps is a very uh, difficult task, which is uh, feasible only with the very clean uh, processing and uh, high accuracy processes. And uh, so, basically the fabrication can be thought of these four steps being re repeated. Uh, the cleaning process is actually repeated many times after every step again and again in a loop until you get the final device. So, you can think of it as a building block, you are making each layer, you are patterning it how you want to pattern it, etching it, then making another layer, patterning it and etching it until you have the final device form. And we just saw a p-n junction how this device form works. So, having understood this uh, microelectronics fabrication principle, we want to now uh, go for basic uh, materials processing of each of this step which can be used uh, for making any particular device. It is not necessarily that the thin film uh, doping is following, it could be along with thin film deposition or doping. Okay, yeah, so, it should be seen as thin film deposition or doping uh, after photolithography or etching. Either you will do a thin film deposition like we did in the case of metal or if you want to go from P to N, it could be doping. So, this uh, need not necessarily it is in a sequence, one can always have a uh, sequence which is going in this manner. You can skip doping if it is not required, it is only required uh, or instead of thin film, thin film deposition you could have only doping. Okay. So, let us uh, look at each of this process in detail. The thin film deposition which is used in the microelectronics industry is basically depositing a material using the using its vapor phase on a substrate and uh, throughout all this fabrication it is important to maintain the cleanliness of each interface. And uh, in thin film deposition which are uh, mainly used in microelectronics industry are used in vacuum for this reason. So, if we look at the thin film deposition here, thin film deposition is a process by which we will use the wafer on which we want to do the deposition and we also call it sometimes substrate. We'll use uh, you will have the vapor source and that is deciding uh, the material you want to deposit. So, there are three steps into in thin film deposition. First is generation of the vapor source and depending on how you generate the vapor source, each technique is called a different name. For example, thermal evaporation if you are heating the material to generate the vapor so source, sputtering if you are using a plasma to generate the vapor source or uh, simply chemical vapor deposition if you are just putting in different chemicals to generate the vapor source. The second step, step is related to the transporting of the vapor source from the uh, uh, to the substrate. And the third step is film deposition on the substrate. Now, uh, these are the basic steps 
uh, which are required to make a film. Now, in all these steps, vacuum plays a very important role. If I am uh, making a vapor source, it is easier to create a vapor source if I am at low vacuum. I need a, a lower temperatures to get a high enough vapor pressures. Um, if uh, even going from in the step 2 transportation to the uh, to the substrate, if I have vacuum then uh, process of contamination is less because you know that uh, in, the, in this step the flux is related to the pressure, the flux of the species is related to the pressure is proportional to the pressure. If I have high pressure in the vacuum chamber, my deposition uh, of the source is competing with the ambient pressure of the chamber. If I reduce that pressure, the contaminants become less and I am depositing more pure film. And for that reason, when I am depositing semiconductors where purity is very important because you know the doping can change quite a lot, you normally use high vacuum. And uh, if I am depositing metal or something, maybe moderate vacuums are sufficient in that uh, case. So, the pressure is the vacuum is important for the second step and also in the third step uh, at the interface if I do not have high vacuum, I will create a contamination layer because the contaminants from the vapor phase uh, which are existing in the chamber can deposit on the surface. So, most of the thin film deposition techniques, techniques which are used in microelectronics are vapor phase based where you are going to create a vacuum depending on your requirement uh, middle, uh, medium level to a high level vacuum to deposit a film. So, vacuum re requirement is important. Now, let us look at uh, how do the uh, film deposit on the substrate and what are the parameters that are important. So, let us understand first in step 3 the surfaces pro surface processes which lead to different uh, film growth mechanisms uh, that will be responsible in creating different layers which could be either semiconductor, insulator or metal depending on the device that we are making. So, what are these surface processes? Uh, we, we are going to deposit on a wafer, a thin film. How are we depositing this thin film? We are depositing it by bringing in a vapor phase a species. So, this is my growth species. Now, growth species uh, what it is? Its chemical composition will decide what I am trying to deposit. How I have created this growth species in a species in a step 1 will decide the energy. And finally, how much is coming per centimeter square per second, the flux will also be decided by the how I am creating these growth species. Once they come to the substrate after being transported through the chamber, this particular atom ion or molecule is going to uh, be interacting with the, uh, the surface. Now, it has two possibilities, it might have enough energy E 0 it gets reflected back. So, if something is reflected back, it is not becoming part of the film and it is not uh, good for you. The other possibility it has it that it loses all its momentum in the vertical direction, it stays on the surface, but is mobile on the surface because of energy in the uh, parallel to the substrate. And since it is mobile on the substrate, it goes to a second point and there in the meantime it uh, loses its energy and becomes thermalized with the substrate. This is known as the thermal accommodation. At this point the growth species coming in is part of the uh, film, but it is not has not formed a bond with the film as yet. This can now surface diffuse because there is a some th temperature at which we have our wafer the T substrate temperature which is a temperature of the substrate or wafer here. This would be the surface diffusion. And at the end of it, it would either be absorbed on the surface adsorption 
and later it can also be dissolved due to thermal activation. So, out of all these processes the atoms which remain absorbed on the surface will, will become part of the film. Anything that is reflected or dissolved is not part of the film. So, the final film structure that you are getting is a combination of how many are absorbed, what is the surface diffusion process and how many are thermally accommodated. And based on this one can create different structures and uh, properties of the different films that we want in the device which again in turn affect the device characteristics. So, uh, having understood this kind of process let us uh, look at uh, what are the ways by which we can control the growth flux or different deposition techniques. So, the first one that comes to our mind is thermal evaporation which is the simplest and the oldest thin film deposition technique. And as we said that in thin film deposition vacuum is necessary for all the three steps of the film deposition especially for microelectronics where you want good interfaces and low contamination. So, we will be uh, making all the deposition in a vacuum chamber. And dep depending on our requirement we will have different kind of vacuum levels here this goes to a pump. In thermal evaporation we have two electrodes which have uh, across which we will put a heating element and whatever material we want to evaporate we will put in this heating element. The heating element need not be heating element it could also be a crucible and uh, by using the electrical uh, power we are heating uh, a resistive element using that heat to melt whatever we want to deposit. And since there is a low vacuum pressure here uh, there will be evaporation of the element that we the material we have put and there will be a partial pressure of, of that material which is going to be transported to the substrate that we keep over here. Now, the things which are important here is that the uh, we should not have any contamination due to evaporation coming from the element itself and that is why we use high melting point materials like molybdenum, tungsten as a element heating element and we, we sometimes even coat it with the ceramics. So, that there is no uh, evap uh, evaporation of the element or electrodes. Once the material is uh, getting evaporated we have a uh, energy associated with it which is decided by the thermal energy of the uh, element to up to which point we have heated uh, that element. The kind of things which are required in, in such a uh, process is how well can you control the temperature. If you can control the temperature of your heat of your uh, um, uh, vapor source very well that means you, ha you are getting a constant flux of the vapor coming to the substrate. In a crude equipment in the laboratory generally that is not uh, there, but once we go to the fabrication floor uh, the temperature control on the source material is very well. So, that you can control the growth flux throughout the process. The other point is the, the distance from the source to the substrate and then that dictates that the film is not uniform throughout the substrate. So, that is important because I am making a device assuming certain thickness whether I my device is here or my device is on this part of the substrate. So, if the, if the thickness of the layer is not same all the processes get affected. So, one of the requirements in processing is that the thickness across the whole wafer should be uh, within certain uh, specification. Uh, and then of course, uh, from the materials properties point of view the film should be of a certain quality which can be controlled by controlling source uh, processes, uh, vacuum and also by controlling the surface processes by looking at the substrate temperature which is an important parameter. So, you have substrate temperature, you have uh, how you create this source and how you create this source uh, processing parameter becomes deposition rate. Are you creating the source uh, to uh, at a high rate or a low rate will decide what would be the characteristics of the source and that will decide the final film property. 
So, this is a simple thermal evaporation uh, equipment. Uh, it is uh, it normally uh, gets less used in the commercial setup for the reason that it has some issues with the non-uniformity on large areas or uh, many devices. The second process which is uh, very common in the industry is the sputtering. And the technique gets its name because we are creating the vapor source by sputtering of a target using ionized gases. In its uh, simplest avatar, uh, sputtering technique can be used, uh, can be seen as a DC, simple DC sputtering technique in which again I have a vacuum chamber, I am uh, pumping it down and in order to create the plasma, I am going to inlet some working gas which is generally a inert gas, argon is a favorite source for this and I am going to apply a voltage across two electrodes. Anode which sometimes is grounded or I can even apply a bias to it and a cathode. across which I apply a negative voltage and generally the chamber body is uh, either grounded or left floating. <coughs> now, when I put in the argon gas and I am applying the voltage as you know that at certain point there will be a plasma created because the electrons are going to be generated at these uh, high uh, field points and these electrons are going to ionize the argon gas when they collide with each, with each other that generates argon ions. Now, what is the situation in this uh, part? Electrons are going to be attracted to the anode and the ions are going to be attracted to the cathode. Eventually, we will come to a point of voltage where this processes get stabilized and you have a source of argon ion to the cathode and electrons will be going towards the anode. Now, this argon ion has high enough energy because it is getting accelerated by the cathode voltage to come to the subsurface and sputter off whatever the target atom I am putting here. So, this becomes my source. So, this would be my uh, target material. So, the ar argon ion are sputtering of the target material and this is now my source which is coming to the anode and I put my substrate at the anode. So, I have a deposition of the target material on the anode. Now, the advantage of sputtering over evaporation is one is that I can I have the choice of making the target very very large and hence that issue of uh, uniformities are better in case of sputtering. And, uh, and there are other considerations uh, as well. In addition to that, it changes the properties of the material to a large extent. Why does it change? Because earlier I just heated the material and the energy of the growth flux was decided by the temperature up to which I heat the material, it is thermodynamically decided. But now I have a voltage and the energy by which the target atom comes out is decided by how uh, by what energy I am going to accelerate the uh, voltage I am going to accelerate the argon ion towards the target and hence I can control the energy of the target material and depending on what is the energy of the target material the processes which are occurring at the substrate while I am growing the film can get affected and which affect the film property. So, that is the advantage on the sputtering which we get a independent control on the energy of the growth flux by using sputtering. Uh, just to uh, mention that this is this is uh, I am discussing only DC sputtering. There are other versions of sputtering 
in which we can use RF sputtering or magnetron sputtering which help uh, the process in terms of deposition rate or uh, making it more uh, efficient. So, to just so now let us look at the effect of high energy bombardment in case of a sputtering of thin films. So, earlier we looked at the surface processes in terms of surface processes with the atoms which are coming with thermal energies uh, of the source material. To whatever extent I have increased the source materials temperature, the energy of the incoming atom uh, was up to that point. But when I go to sputtering, now I have that additional voltage which will increase the energy of the incoming atom. And based on that I can uh, talk about some processes. So, if I have an atom which is coming at energies something like E 1 and I am looking at the processes which I saw when I was looking at processes due to thermal evaporation. This additional energy is going to do what? It is going to enhance all the surface processes. Additional energy is going to give more energy to all the enhance the surface diffusion. desorption and reaction. So, it, when you have additional energy with which you are your growth flux is coming, you enhance all these processes. So, in some sense whatever is however you are making the film it is becoming uh, bonded by with more energetic processes and uh, this uh, this would be then. Uh, help in making the film properties better uh, sometimes. You can have another case where this energy is uh, atom is coming with much higher energy. In this case when E 2 becomes even more than E 1, then you can have a case where this atom comes and it takes an atom on the substrate and it rather than sitting there uh, only by itself it sputters of the atom on the substrate. So, basically what is happening when I increase the energy which is slightly larger than the, the E 1, in addition to becoming part of the film that atom is actually sputtering of the film. So, in at, uh, rather than depositing the film it is etching the film. Now, this process is used for dry etching, it's, it is what you use in uh, iron etching when you hit uh, a surface with uh, uh, high enough energy uh, at uh, ions it is going to uh, or atoms it is going to sputter of the film and you will etch away the film and this is used as a dry etching process. Now, I can take this energy to even further E 3 such that E 3 is greater than E 2 and this atom when it comes here now it has much more energy and it does few more things than just being part of the film. What does it do? It can be it can go in and I am enlarging this area uh, now because I want to show some processes. So, this is a film area I am showing in an enlarged form what is happening in this uh, film. The incoming high energy atom can uh, come and have a collision with the atom of the film. This whole area is just showing the film now and as a result this atom will get displaced from where it was and the incoming atom which was coming here will also get displaced de depending on what was the collision uh, kinematics the incoming one is going on the other direction and the atom of the thin film is going in this direction. Now, I have two energetic particles one is the incoming atom and the one which is being displaced inside the film. So, I this will further have collisions and it can create again another damage and it can go to some other place. So, if I continue this process eventually it will lose all its energy in uh, different collisions and this atom is going to may come to rest at some point deep in the film the incoming atom and the same time 
the atom which is displaced inside the film will also come to a rest after losing its additional energy. So, what it has done? I have implanted the incoming atom deep into the film and I have created the damage in this film. Now, this damage can work both ways either can change the properties or it can be used uh, can be annealed out later, but it is changing the structure of the film than what it was if I was just thermally growing on the surface. So, sub is sputtering then leads to either etching which is dry etching or it can lead to implanted atoms damage and this region in which it, this is happening we call it subsurface because this is below the surface. these processes are happening on the surface. Okay. So, with the help of sputtering I am changing my film deposition method by adding more energy to the incoming atoms and that has some beneficial effects on certain films and sometimes it is uh, uh, not so beneficial and that uh, comes only by experience and the applications that one is looking at. So, we have discussed thin film uh, deposition by two techniques thermal evaporation and sputtering and both are physical vapor deposition. I am using a physical process to create the growth species and by that I am adding material to my device structure. Next we discuss a technique which is using chemical vapors to deposit the material and that is known as the chemical vapor deposition technique. In chemical vapor deposition technique we do not create the species by a physical process we use the chemical gases and we react them on the substrate to get the film. In a very uh, uh, simple schematic I can think of the chemical deposition process in which I have the substrate or wafer I am bringing in some gases here. this could be at a higher temperature. These gases react here and the byproducts are taken out and I deposit a film by reaction of the gases on the surface. Now, this is basically decided by the again thermodynamics and the, the reaction rate at the sub, uh, substrate temperature and what gases I am using in order to deposit a film. For example, If I wanted to deposit silicon, I will use dichlorosilane gas plus hydrogen to deposit silicon on this uh, substrate and whatever the byproducts HCl plus uh, different uh, uh, compositions of uh, silanes or dichlorosilanes dichloros will come out as byproduct. Uh, here substrate temperature would play a very important role. Now, chemical vapor deposition uh, uh, technique uh, is uh, uh, good for many materials because uh, the controlling step there is no damage here due, as in sputtering and uh, you can control different gases and substrate temperature to get a very uniform film. So, this is uh, generally used for making uh, silicon, uh, gallium arsenide and many semiconducting materials by CVD technique. Um, there are certain versions of again this technique we are talking about very simplest uh, form of it which is uh, known as in this technique I do not need necessarily a vacuum process it can be a atmospheric pressure CVD. So, this stands for CVD I can have a atmospheric pressure CVD without vacuum, but if I want higher priority and uh, better control I will go for low pressure CVD. Uh, I can have different techniques called plasma enhanced CVD by which I can reduce the substrate temperature at which I am depositing the film that has some beneficial effects uh, in terms of overall processing of semiconductor devices. So, one can go on and uh, look at several techniques that is also metal, metal organic chemical vapor deposition 
which is very common for depositing 3, 5 semiconductors. Um, so, that is uh, one technique. Finally, another technique which is very, very common in the microelectronics processing and that is thermal oxidation of silicon. So far all the techniques of thin film growth that we have seen, we brought the material from outside and deposited on a substrate. But in case of thermal oxidation, we bring only oxygen and we oxidize the surface of silicon to convert it into silicon oxide and that is why many times it is known as silicon oxide growth rather than deposition. Deposition is because some part of the film uh, of the substrate is being used while we are making the film. Now, in thermal oxidation, Basically, we use uh, it is used most uh, in the case of silicon processing where we start with silicon substrate. We are bringing either dry oxygen or sometimes we bring water vapor plus oxygen that is known as wet oxidation. So, dry oxidation or wet oxidation and this then reacts with the silicon and form a, forms a silicon oxide. I am using this uh, changing the uh, interface between silicon oxide and silicon because I have used some of the silicon. So, that interface is a moving interface. Now, this process has some very nice properties and that has uh, that is one of the um, advantages that silicon has. As we oxidize silicon and make silicon oxide, this interface remains flat. The interface created here is of very high quality. That is, uh, it, it is flat, there is no roughness at the interface. Um, if you have cleaned the surface uh, very well, then even the defects can be reduced to a large extent. And as well as the oxide that is created by thermal oxidation is of the highest quality. Normally, when we end up depositing oxides by bringing some sort of silicon oxide, both uh, cursors from, uh, precursors from outside, we compare it with the properties of the silicon oxide. The thermally grown silicon oxide has the best dielectric constant uh, compared to all the different dip, uh, thin film deposition techniques. Uh, so, this uh, thermal oxidation that is why is a very important process in microelectronics uh, of uh, uh, fabrication of silicon related devices. And this property of silicon oxide uh, and silicon interface uh, makes possible many of the devices that we use today, especially MOS transistor that, uh, that has a specific properties that uh, come from its uh, properties. Uh, in case of uh, silicon, silicon oxide, uh, one can talk more from uh, materials point of view, how uh, the oxidation takes place. And it is important to know that when you, when the oxidation initially starts, it is being uh, governed by the kinetics of the interface reaction. But once you start growing a little bit of film, it gets governed by the diffusion of the oxidizing species through that oxide up to the interface, because the reaction takes place at this interface which is moving. So, if one, if one plots oxidation rate for the thermal oxidation, as a function of time, then in the uh, beginning of the oxidation, when the oxygen directly comes to the interface, it is just the reaction rate that controls the thing and it is almost a linear dependence on, on uh, time. But once you start growing a little bit of thin oxide, it is the species which is diffusing through this oxide layer comes to this uh, interface where it is reacting that decides the reaction rate and the, the deposition rate oxidation rate becomes parabolic in nature. So, there is a linear region and there is a parabolic region here for oxidation of silicon and it is a very important process in the thermal uh, in the microelectronics fabrication of silicon related devices. In the end uh, we have discussed some very uh, key de uh, thermal deposition processes, sputtering processes, CVD processes and thermal oxidation, uh, but there are many more variants. I just uh, gave a glimpse of it uh, and it is not possible to cover it here, 
but from the microelectronics fabrication point of view, what are we looking at? We are looking at in the film and I am making it uh, a film on a wafer or a substrate. The important part is I have as I was showing you we pattern each layer and then we deposit another layer. So, I may have some sort of pattern layer on it and I am trying to deposit a film on this. One thing I would like to see is that whatever I deposit has a good thickness uniformity. So, uniformity of thickness is one of the criteria. The other thing which is important is when I am growing it on some sort of features, it is not a flat surface, then it is possible that at these features I may have some voids here. The film does not conformally grow on the whole feature, but it leaves some voids and that is uh, we call it conformity. And uh, this could be a problem when certain type of devices where the contact to this feature is important. The other kind of problem that can happen is that thickness may not remain same, it might become very large at certain areas. So, that uniformity of thickness is issue. Some other issues come up, sometimes you end up getting holes in this films. This could start because there was some contamination as uh, we pointed out throughout the microelectronics fabrication cleanliness is very important because our feature size are very small. The each thing we are making are in microns, sub microns and even now going into nanometer range. So, even a small dust particle can create a defect which is known as pinhole and they can have their uh, impact on the device characteristics in some sense. Sometimes you can create voids inside the film that could be a problem and overall in all this sometimes you may have roughness on the surface that could be a problem. So, these are the macro structure macro structural features of the film which are important. In addition to that you have some microstructure of the film. which is you might have some grains here, might have voids here, it might be amorphous in nature and that will affect the film property. So, overall uh, no matter which deposition technique we use, finally when we incorporate it in a device, it is its macrostructures and the microstructure is what is important to us. So, by using controlling our deposition technique, we are controlling the film structure. So, film structure is what is our ultimate goal getting the, the right film structure by whichever technique we choose to use and uh, that also sometimes decide which technique we are going to use. So, we have covered uh, the one aspect of uh, microelectronics fabrication which is how do we add material and we use one of the film thin film deposition techniques and what are our requirements in that thin film deposition technique. Next uh, we will take up uh, how do we change the conductivity of the material by using a doping mechanism and that is the second requirement because we want to create p n junctions or MOS transistors uh, in that case. So, uh, what we just saw was how to make a p n junction using a planar technology and we can divide the processes that we have discussed in two type of processes. One is to add a new material which is a thin film deposition process and or to change the characteristics of a material by uh, incorporating dopants in it and the second type of process is when we pattern the layer that we have added and that is uh, incorporating photolithography and etching. And uh, by using uh, these two processes in different sequences, we can make any structure we want in three dimension. So, this is what uh, uh, we can say that uh, main unit processes in case of microelectronics fabrication are thin film deposition. second being dopant incorporation photolithography
etching and then throughout these processes we have intermittent a process which is extremely important to maintain the yield of microelectronics fabrication and that is the cleaning process. And by using these processes in a certain sequence we can make any structure uh, that we require. Next we will be discussing the doping process, dopant incorporation. The dopant incorporation in the material uh, changes its electrical characteristics. We already know and since we are taking the example of silicon, if I take uh, silicon and dope it with some p type dopants, example being boron, then I can make it a p type semiconductor and that is what is required for my devices. And if I take, uh, if I put phosphorus or arsenic, then I can make it a n type semiconductor. And we saw in p n junctions that how much dopant I put basically decides on what type, type of device characteristics we get. So, controlling how much dopant I put to what extent to what thickness I put is important in this particular process. Uh, just to uh, remind you again of the kind of the amount of the dopant that we are going to put in this, silicon has roughly about 10 to the power 22 atoms per centimeter cube and depending on the device requirement what we are making we are going to put in the range of about 10 to the power 16 to 10 to the power 20 atoms of dopant per centimeter cube in silicon in order to make a device. The low end is used for making p n junctions and the high end is used for making ohmic contacts. Now, we have two ways of incorporating this dopant and the first one is the diffusion process. The second one is ion implantation. <coughs> In the diffusion process, we can start with uh, putting in the dopant material in the wafer in two ways and the first one is we take the wafer on which we want to incorporate the dopant, we put a spin on glass on top of this wafer and dope it with whatever we want to dope. For example, spin on glass is a a silane derivative and we put carboborane in it and uh, spin coat of film on it, which is further annealed and this gives me silicon oxide plus bor boron oxide. Now, this boron oxide is depending on what concentration I want in this film, I can control the amount of it. After that, I have a thermal annealing process which is called in diffusion process. In this thermal annealing process, boron oxide reacts with the silicon to give me boron and SiO2 and I can control uh, balance this equation to give me 4 boron atoms and uh, 3 silicon oxide molecules. Now, this free boron will get incorporated because I am t putting it a, a thermal annealing in this region. The boron is incorporated in the first top two layers. Now, this incorporation is because of diffusion of boron from the spin on glass into the silicon layer and one can do the analysis of the uh, diffusion equation and figure out how much boron will be incorporated 
and if I look at the distance from the surface, starting from x down, the boron concentration, then the surface concentration is going to be decided by the equilibrium of this re reaction at the interface and depending on for how long I have done the end diffusion process, I will have a concentration gradient in which this is, uh, the, this is for time t 1 time t 2 which is greater than t 1. So, depending on how, how far I want to take this diffusion, I can uh, do the end diffusion process for different timings. Generally, it is done for a very short time because I want certain amount of dopant incorporated and uh, after that I will do a second process which is called drive in process. to decide exactly at where I want a junction, because normally I would have some background doping of the material. And whatever dopant I want, let us say this was n type, then wherever the n type doping is equivalent to the p type doping that is my junction depth. And depending on my device requirement, I can decide for how long I need to diffuse to change this junction depth. But uh, at this point, I have only introduced some amount of dopant inside. If I keep on the dopant source there, then if I heat further to change the junction depth, I will put a lot more dopant. So, normally at this stage, the second process which is done is removal of the spin on glass. So, now I have my sus substrate and some in diffused dopant which is constant and I have removed the source of the dopant. And if I do a thermal annealing for certain temp at certain temperature and time, whatever I had put in in the first process of in diffusion will further get diffused in. And that solution is normally Grossian because my amount is fixed. So, if I have initial dopant in diffusion process this, if I heat it this is going to be further diffused in depending on the time and temperature and my junction can be controlled by uh, looking at the dopant concentration. And distance next direction. So, for different time and temperature I can control what concentration I want and to up to which depth. This is the drive in process. So, basically diffusion in this process is a uh, four step. The first one is uh, putting the source material second step is the in diffusion process in which the amount I want to put in the silicon, I in, in diffuse that pr uh, process. Then I remove the source, otherwise a very large amount of dopant will go in, source is removed in the third process. And in the fourth process, I have the drive in where I control the time and temperature to get the required concentration of the dopant and the required depth of the junction. Now, uh, this is spin on glass is not the only way we can introduce the dopant source. There are other ways of introducing the dopant source. One can have a gaseous source. So, I have the wafer here, a gaseous source comes and reacts and leaves the dopant at the surface. I can have a solid source, but solid source also works in the manner that the gaseous source work. I start with the solid source and uh, heat it 
to get the vapors which react with the surface. I can have a liquid source also of the dopant material. Again, it works uh, often uh, in the manner that I will use a liquid source and I will pump in the carrier gas which could be nitrogen, a uh, noble gas and then this carrier gas bubbles through the liquid source, carries with it some amount of the liquid source and then uh, it is brought into the contact with the surface. So, spin on glass is not the only way of incorporating the dopant. I could use any of these three sources to react with the surface for a certain amount of time, so that I put the required amount of dopant in the film. And then uh, in the drive in process, I can control the temperature and time to figure out to what depth I want to uh, control the, diff, uh, uh, the junction. The next process which is uh, this uh, was used uh, quite a lot in the earlier semiconductor industry, but diffusion has certain limitation because the amount of dopant we are putting in is uh, controlled by the thermodynamics is what is the reaction between the source and the silicon. But later on when uh, a higher control was required we wanted to put very less amount and have very shallow junction and that was not possible to control using diffusion. And uh, hence, a new process was uh, borrowed from the uh, 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 from the nuclear physics community, and that is known as ion implanter. <coughs> so, in an ion implanter, the dopant incorporation is done by introducing ions. How do we get these ions? These are normally the source gases like diborane uh, in case of boron. This is ionized. The gas is ionized which means I have boron ion and some hydrides in there. Then it is further put through a analyzer to separate out only the B plus ion and these ions are then accelerated to the energies up to tens to about 100 kilo electron volts. So, you have by this process very high energy ions coming to the surface and you can incorporate it in the film as opposed to diffusing it from a different source. So, in, uh, in this technology in semiconductor technology this part is used from uh, the accelerator physics. To for how to create the ions. So, the process uh, by which we control how much dopant is put in uh, is like this, we bring the ions through the accelerator and this is the wafer. This wafer is generally grounded and since we are bringing in the ions, we are able to measure the current. Since, if you have grounded it it, the electrons must be coming to neutralize the wafer. So, we can measure how many how much ion current is coming per second and then uh, this uh, ion is rostered on the wafer. So, in, in the sense since ion current is not going to be the size of the wafer, we will put the ion beam is rostered across the wafer for a certain time and it is putting the dopant inside the material. Now, how much dopant it is putting? Let us say if the current for the ion beam is I, current is nothing but charge per unit area. Charge will be decided by what is the uh, valency of the ion. Let us assume it is Z. I have taken the case of boron plus, but it could be something else and then the charge for the electron that is going to be the current and how, uh, per second how much of it is com coming uh, will decide um, this is a charge that is going to be the ion current. So, let us say I, it takes me about time t to roster through the whole wafer, then how much dopant have I put in? The amount of the dopant incorporated
is going to be the total current multiplied by the time for which I have I am rostering it divided by the charge that gives me the ions. If I divide it by z times q, it gives me the number of ions coming per, uh, in the total time t. Now, this number of ion is distributed in the area of the wafer because I was rostering through the whole wafer. So, per unit area, this is the number of ions coming per second. So, this is uh, the incorporation using a ion source, this will be the number of ions coming per unit area per centimeter square per second. Okay. So, this is the way one will incorporate the dopant or whatever amount I want by controlling the current and the time. Now, generally how would I uh, do this uh, procedure is I can uh, it is difficult to monitor the current of the implant. So, rather than monitoring the current I am going to monitor the total current coming through this uh, meter here how much is being received by the surface. So, this I can integrate. So, normally I will have a reading of current here as a function of time and I will integrate that current over the total time that I implanted and that gives me the total dose this is what I will call the total dose I have put in my wafer and that will give me the total amount I have put in my wafer. Okay. So, uh, if I know how much total I have put the next thing I want to know is where has it gone. Now, in case of uh, uh, most implantation I am going to put the dopant about 10 to 100 nanometers below the surface. So, if I look at the distribution of the dopant that I put in by the ion beam the distribution of the dopant is normally it is a statistical process because the dopant comes into the surface uh, it has it is going to be stopped by the substrate atoms where it is going in there are two type of mechanism by which it is get, uh, getting a stopped one is the nuclear stopping and the other one is the electronic stopping. Nuclear stopping is basically uh, the dopant ion coming in and interacting with the atom on the surface and electronic is stopping is that it coming with high energy and uh, interacting coulombically with the electrons. But eventually this atom is going to lose all its energy it has come up with something like 10 to 100 keV and it is uh, going to lose all of its energy at some point and since this is a statistical process how it is stopped some of them are going to stop here some are going to stop there it is going to be a range at which it will stop. Okay. So, this uh, the average of the atoms the large number of dopants that we have put it is called range and there will be a standard deviation to this range. So, this is the uh, how much into the substrate I have put in my uh, uh, atoms and that is generally in the range of 10 to 100 nanometer. Now, since it is a statistical, statistical process and each uh, ion is following a trajectory and I am taking averages of that in addition to in the x direction I am going to also have a straggle in the y direction. It, uh, I have put the beam here, but there is going to be a uh, standard deviation in the y and z direction and that is normally called as the straggle. But interestingly this is less than what you would get the amount of uh, variation by diffusion. In diffusion it is the same process by which I am getting um, the same mechanism by which I diffuse in something and the same mechanism by which I will diffuse in the y and z direction. So, the uh, amount of diffusion in the lateral direction is quite a lot. In ion implantation the struggle is still much much smaller compared to the range. So, one, one has a good control on the, um, the area in which uh, I have diffused the material. Basically what we are saying is if I have put in a mask window opened a window and I wanted to diffuse a dopant through a diffusion process the diffusion process will give me dopant going in the x direction as well in the y or z direction and this variation the how much you go below the pattern is much more in case of diffusion and I can control it better if I do ion implantation this is going to be a lot better control process the struggle is little less and that is the reason why when as, as the densities of uh, devices went up 
people went from diffusion processes to ion implantation processes. Ion implantation has become much more popular compared to uh, dopant incorporation by diffusion. Um, so, this is uh, one way of um, uh, incorporating dopant. Where are the controls here? I can control the amount of dopant which is known as dose by controlling the current and by controlling the time, time for the dosage, right. And I can control the range which basically decides how far I am, I am putting in by controlling the primary energy of the beam which is this uh, 100, 10 to 100 keV. So, if I have low energy, it will be closer to the surface, high energy I can go deeper in. So, the primary energy of the beam can control the range. Now, but this is not sufficient because as we saw earlier in the thin film deposition, when I am putting in implanting high energy atoms, I am getting a lot of damage. So, generally the ion implantation processes which are normally done at room temperature as opposed to diffusion processes which are done at higher temperature and that is why they lead to a lot more struggle create a lot of damage which has to be annealed out. But the only purpose there is annealing and hence a shorter annealing is required as compared to diffusion process. So, one of the problems in, in this ion implantation is the damage annealing. because as the iron goes in it creates a highly damaged surface which has to be annealed out. And this, uh, this annealing uh, also then would change the profile, there will be some diffusion on what you have implanted. So, when you design the whole process one has to look at both the process, the annealing process as well as the implantation process and that will give the final junction that you want for the ion implantation. So, uh, by this process then what we have done is we have learned how to uh, control the uh, uh, dopant incorporation in a device by two different processes and uh, both are uh, ne necessary because just a simple semiconductor is not good. We always need a junction either a PN junction or some other junction to make a interesting device. So, now we come to the next process which is photolithography. Now, uh, I described the photolithography the basic process earlier and right now I will talk about how uh, it is done and what are the major requirements for it. So, this is a process by which uh, I am going to pattern the added layers. So, in, in this process what we do is we start with whatever layer I want to pattern and we will deposit a photoresist. Now, what is a photoresist? It is a polymer mix, it has a photoactive material. plus a matrix plus a solvent. Many times if we are commercially getting a photoresist, uh, one does not know the actual identity of the photoactive material, uh, but a lot of information is existing in the literature to find out what kind of photoactive materials exist. Now, depending on the nature of the photoactive material, uh, once I uh, uh, put the photoresist on the film I would remove the solvent that is known as the pre baked process and now I am left with only photoactive material and the matrix. Depending on what is the photoactive material if upon exposure it is easier to remove the, the PR film then we call it a positive photoresist. On the other hand if upon exposure this PR film becomes very tough and it is not possible to remove it, then we will call it a negative photoresist. 
and that depends on the photoactive material that is in there and it has uh, its own applications related to that. So, if we uh, take it further, uh, we then uh, expose this layer to the UV light. through a mask. So, I have put the PR and then I expose this layer through a mask. Wherever there is an opening, the PR layer is going to be exposed at this point. Now, uh, if I am, if I, if this is a material I want to leave behind, then that will decide what kind of PR I am going to use. So, if this is a positive PR and I am exposing in this manner, what I will have in the end is a window here. On the other hand, if it was a negative PR and I was exposing it with the same mask, I would have a, uh, a small amount of uh, PR left here, rest will be removed. So, one can use uh, the mask design and the PR in uh, 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 together to get the desired pattern. So, if I uh, were to summarize then all the processes which are important in the PR processing, initially you will have the silicon wafer on which the layer you want to um, pattern is there. Let us say I will start with silicon, silicon oxide and silicon here and this is the layer I want to pattern. Then the second step I will do is in the photolithography is coat with a PR and this is spin coating. So, I have got PR now on silicon oxide and silicon and then there is a soft baking. The soft baking is to remove the solvent from the PR and you are left with the matrix and the photoactive material and so at the end of it you still have the two layers of the PR and the silicon oxide on the substrate. Then I will expose it to a mask and depending on uh, what kind of PR I have, I, I will design two different kind of mask. For the for, for the positive PR, I will open a window here that will expose the PR layer. For a negative mask, I will do the other way round. So, my window, I will cover the region where I want to retain the pattern and the remaining will be exposed. And here the light is blocked and the same I am going to for the negative PR. So, this is a negative PR and this is a positive PR. At the end when I develop it what will happen? If I have used it this, this part has become hard and it will be left out after the uh, after the developing. If I have used this, then this was already hard and what was developed will be removed. So, in the end whether I have used a positive or negative since I changed my mask, I am left with the pattern of the PR which is this. So, this is after developing. So, developer is used to get this pattern and uh, developer may be different for positive PR and for the negative PR. Now, this pattern will have to be hard baked because after this I am going to do some processes where I will either etch the silicon oxide and I do not want my PR removed. I want that to be uh, to be remaining there. So, I will do a hard baking after this process. And uh, at the end of it, we will use what we learn next, the etch process that is to remove the remaining oxide. So, in the end I am left with PR and the oxide which I wanted to save because the remaining part I would have etched using uh, chemicals like HF and the substrate. And at the end then the last process is 
to remove the PR. So, this photolithography process has many controls that one needs to gather and the process is defined by what is the smallest feature I can pattern. And uh, today uh, what we, I have talked about is the UV exposure here, but if I want to make large number of devices I need to reduce this feature which means I need photolithography steps which can pattern even a smaller feature. In order to do that I need to change the UV light to something which is either E beam or X ray. That is why E beam is used for making finer or nano scale uh, features. The process is basically same, but the mechanism change instead of UV exposure we are going to a different light. So, that is one part is to change the exposure to get finer and finer features and of course, the development in the PR so that you can define the, the patterns that you need to define. So, there is a lot of uh, development that goes on to uh, match up with the, the advances in the overall microelectronics industry uh, in the case of photolithography. <coughs> Next we uh, talk about the process which is uh, related to removing the part of the layer because finally, what we wanted to do is pattern each layer after we have added that layer we wanted to pattern that layer. So, we have found a way of patterning the layer uh, and we etch the film. So, what, what we want to do is talk about this etching process. Now, the etching process uh, can be of two kinds. One is the dry etching. And the other ca can be the wet etching process. So, taking example of uh, again silicon silicon oxide let us say if I had silicon and I deposit a silicon oxide layer by one of the thin film deposition technique then I wanted to create uh, a window here for my next process. I did the PR and opened the window in the PR and I want to now etch away this region. So, um, one way to do is to uh, do the wet etching and in case of silicon HF is a wonderful etchant because it etches silicon oxide at much higher rate compared to the silicon. So, there is a differential in the etching rate of silicon and silicon oxide. So, when I etch with HF it removes the silicon oxide, but it keeps the silicon, but there are problems with this kind of process. Silicon oxide if it is amor it is amorphous in nature and uh, Then if I am doing the etching by uh, a wet etchant process, then the etchant is not only etching in the x direction again it is etching in this manner. So, as you can see the final pattern that I get is going to have etching even below the window that I open. So, if I look at this final pattern it is going to look something like this. This is going to be the etched hole in the silicon oxide and these uh, edges can be a problematic for the remaining process. So, suppose I want to deposit a film then I would not get the film here. So, this can be issues uh, with the process. So, wet etching, etching has this process because wet etching is basically isotropic etching. it is same in all directions. On the other hand if my uh, if the, the, the layer I want to etch is crystalline. Now, crystalline layers have a very uh, unique feature because when I am etching those layers uh, the etch rate of different planes are going to be different. So, if, uh, if I take an example of etching uh, silicon itself. And I open a window in the PR, then the silicon the way it etches depends on what is the orientation of the silicon is it 1 0 0 or 1 1 1. Depending on that orientation you are going to get different type of etching profiles here and this is used in the MEMS. It is not as much useful for microelectronics, but in the MEMS devices where you want to create cavities 
one needs to know uh, what kind of cavity you want to, to create. So, when you have crystalline uh, materials, then the etching is not uh, uh, isotropic, it depends on the orientation of the crystalline material. So, these, uh, these are the advantages of uh, wet etching that if you find the right chemical, you can do the etching uh, fairly easily, but the problem is in transferring the right dimension to the, uh, uh, to the substrate. So, in order to solve that problem, one goes to dry etching. Now, what is there in the dry etching? It is a similar process that we discuss in sputtering. So, if the layer that I want to discuss to uh, remove I want to make sure that I remove only this region and not in the lateral region, then I can bring in some dry etchant. What could be a dry etchant? Ionized gases that are accelerated towards the substrate. What do they do? They will sputter off this material. Okay. So, that is one way of dry etching. Uh, so, this is basically sputtering. Now, since I am accelerating these gases towards the substrate, it is highly directional. I do not have uh, the argon ion or uh, whatever the etching ion is going away in other directions. So, the etching is go going to be done in only in the x direction, there is very little y direction etching. Now, in to further enhance this sputtering process by which we are doing uh, etching, we can add some chemicals to it. And if I do that, we call that reactive ion etching. And we use a lot of fluorocarbons uh, in this process in which in addition to sputtering, the ion that comes reacts with the surface and then the reactant product is removed. So, uh, the RIE etching is again a way of uh, using the ions plus some chemicals which would react with the surface and then remove get, get removed. So, we have uh, uh, the advantage of dry etching is it has very little lateral etching is minimized. But we need to uh, use some controls. In the case of wet etching, what we had was that silicon was not etching by HF. So, it automatically stopped. Once you have removed all the silicon oxide, there will be no more etching of the silicon. But in case of dry etching, these ions and the reactions, the ions do not know whether I am etching silicon oxide or the next material. So, they can continue on and hence there is a proper end point detection that has to be involved. So, one keeps looking at the byproducts in the gases to figure out when the process has to be stopped. So, there is a considerable amount of process development that goes on to designing these processes uh, for each microelectronic device. And so, there is a lot of process development that is required uh, in these areas. Uh, in this uh, um, uh, process of uh, dry and wet etching, uh, one can uh, uh, also talk about uh, the in the same manner the cleaning processes. <coughs> so, the problem with dry etching processes is that we have energetic ions. The energetic ions uh, as we saw earlier in the ion implantation as well as in thin film deposition will go inside the layers which is below, uh, below it and that can create problems with the device overall. So, uh, dry etching although is good from the point of view of dimension control is sometimes not good for the 
property of the underlying layer. So, one has to look at the effect of the dry, etch, dry etching on the device characterization. It could affect the device uh, properties by controlling the material properties. So, the damage due to the energetic ions has to be monitored. So, because of this both dry and the uh, wet etching are uh, prevalent in the microelectronics fabrication uh, right now. Uh, now, we look at uh, last process uh, which is uh, cleaning process. It seems to be a very uh, benign process, but it is extremely important because as we said each layer interface is extremely important. And hence when I do a process uh, flow in which I have number of steps, I can add lot of contamination. Where can the contamination come from? They can come from the materials that I am using. They can come from the process materials. If I am using an etchant, the contaminants could be in the etchant or could be in the gases. Hence, uh, between each process, uh, between uh, two processes, we would like to do a cleaning process where I remove the different type of contaminants which have been introduced. And uh, depending on which surface I am cleaning, there are different chemistries. But uh, there is one which is very uh, well known and that is known as RCA cleaning. The name goes after Radio Corporation of America which first introduced it. <coughs> now, they have devised uh, a good way of uh, controlling silicon surfaces or silicon oxide surfaces. So, this is uh, typically for silicon silicon oxide surfaces. And in this cleaning, there are several steps which are there designed for certain type of activity. And the first one is known as the piranha etch. Which is basically sulfuric acid, hydrogen peroxide and di water. and uh, its concentration and dilution people change depending on their need. And what it does is this it, it oxidizes the organic com contaminants. This follows generally with the process called RCA 1. The RCA 1 consists of ammonium hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide and di water. And in this process whatever has been oxidized earlier is removed. So, it removes particles and oxidized contaminants. Now, I am talking a lot about particles because you would realize that all the dimensions we are talking about are very, very small and today in the range of sub micron and nano range. So, even a small particle if I am making let us say a window of this kind which is in sub micron range and if I have a particle sitting on top of it. I will not be able to do any further processing with this particular device and this device will eventually fail. And hence in all these cleaning processes I ensure by these two things that I remove all the particles on the surface. Uh, and if I look at uh, under the uh, microscope the surface I can actually see particles being remo removed after these processes. This is then uh, followed by a process called RCA2. The RCA2 consists of hydrochloric acid hydrogen peroxide and di water. And the main purpose of RCA 2 is to remove the metallic impurities. And this you can understand in the context of what you have learned about the different type of impurities and how they behave. Uh, since all the chemicals do have some metallic impurity and if they get into the device performance uh, in the device in, at the interface, these are creating traps. 
traps which would then uh, have problems with the recombination of the charges or injection of the charges and hence metallic impurities are extremely sens uh, sensitive for uh, microelectronics fabrication. And uh, by doing RCA2 you remove these uh, metallic impurities that can affect your uh, interface property. Finally, uh, the last process which is comes in the sequence is known as a dilute HF process uh, which of course has HF. Uh, sometimes it is buffered HF by ammonium fluoride uh, and it can be used at different dilution and the purpose here is to remove the small oxidized layer. And uh, if you are doing cleaning of a gate oxide silicon oxide surface probably you will not do this last HF step because you would be removing the oxide. But if you are cleaning the silicon and you want to remove any oxide on top of it then this last dilute HF step is required. So, by uh, doing these four processes if you have silicon surfaces where you are on the silicon pristine surface for making the next layer then these steps are uh, generally used and each has a certain purpose, it removes particle, it removes contamination of the surface. So, your interface quality remains to be good and you do not introduce the additional traps and recombination centers in the structure. Uh, so, this uh, gives a uh, feel of the cleaning processes. Uh, today, the amount of the uh, chemicals that one uses or the DI water in the cleaning processes uh, is very large. And so, there is a trend to go for processes which are using uh, uh, gaseous HNs and the idea there is these uh, gases can be recycled. So, you can have reduce your consumption of the chemicals. So, uh, there is a move go to go from wet cleaning processes to dry cleaning processes for uh, the same purpose of uh, removal of particles uh, by using uh, gaseous uh, uh, sources. Now, in after doing all this normally one does a final D I rinse and a nitrogen drying to get the final surface. Now, uh, this again seems to be a very benign process, but can be very important because if you do not do the proper rinsing and drying, you may end up getting the water spots on the surface. And when you are dealing with very, very fine uh, resolution of the devices, these water spots can again uh, destroy particular devices and reduce the yield. So, uh, in the end uh, what we have looked at is uh, looked at the each process uh, in microelectronics fabrication and uh, we have uh, seen how the fabrication has uh, developed along with the devices and that has led to a very highly controlled uh, manufacturing technology. Uh, the technology that we discussed is known as the planar technology. And the advantage that it has it, it is it is it drives the industry. There is normally uh, uh, before a new device comes, the process development is going hand in hand with the new device to to make the uh, uh, make the product. And hence, uh, the development of semiconductor industry has been phenomenal in the last 60 years, starting from the first transistor, which was which came in uh, late uh, 50s to now. Uh, we have uh, chips which are absolutely cheap. Uh, we can enjoy the electronic devices at a very cheaper rate thanks to the process technology along with the development of the devices.